Hello, everyone. Yeah, over the past few years, I've been keeping an eye on SIP technology, and I've been wondering why it didn't progress. And quite frankly, I've been looking at it initially from a security angle because I wanted to have encryption, and nothing really worked until ZRTP, ZRTP came along, which made me really happy, made me dive into SIP again, and I immediately bounced into the big problem of SIP, and that's not. And the solution, of course, is trivial. It's running it over IP6 and being harsh about it. Now, SIP can be really tremendously powerful and beautiful. This is a picture of a friend of mine, Brechtje Lulofs. She's an artist, and she draws these beautiful, stylish, nostalgic uh, pictures. She's a really good illustrator, I think. And yesterday, when I was preparing for this talk and making my slides, um, my phone told me I had an incoming phone call from my front door, which, of course, is a SIP phone. And she was slightly confused. This was not what the pattern she had expected. But this is a sort of fun thing you can do with SIP, right? Um, I was away for a few days when my Raspberry Pi was... I, I got an email that my Raspberry Pi would be delivered out next day, and I wouldn't be there. Now, that's a disaster. So what you do, you log on to your phone, you reroute it to a few neighbors who call over SIP, and they, they pick, up the f pick up your front, front door walk outside, meet the, meet the package delivery guy, pick up the package, and walk away again. This is the sort of fun that SIP is meant for. It's very useful. Now, um, you could say, why talk about SIP at all? It's all been designed. There's lots of extensions, beautiful, and it's just about communicating, hey, I'm going to send some media, you pick it up. It's trivial. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, SIP is very much hampered by NAT issues, and even more than FTP, where at least one side is a server, so you can say, I'll go passive, and I'll just do it the other way around, and then I will pierce through my own NAT. With SIP, you have peer-to-peer -peer communication. You will preferably send your media stream peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's not working. Other things are also complicating, like there's, uh, at least in the Netherlands, but I believe in many other countries as well, the party acting as your ISP doubles as a as a telco, and that doesn't make them really open to providing SIP as open as we all want it to be, and hopefully someday my parents can use, for example. Um, users don't understand how to free themselves. Uh, you can explain that they could call for free, but they'll grasp the free beer aspect, not the free speech aspect. And that, I think, is something, well, you have to show, and they'll, you have to show that you're uh, available for telephony at your email address, and they'll understand it. Now, just very quickly, what's the problem with NAT? You have two, two phones talking to some sort of a PBX. Sorry about the crummy graphics, by the way. I had a font meltdown, and uh, I had to use this crummy open office that, well, I don't like it. I, later, it's much nicer, but I'll, this will have to do. One phone connects to the PBX. It says, uh, I've got an invitation for you. Yeah, I'll pick it up. By then, they've exchanged a media stream, and they will directly exchange this traffic. Except in practice, because in practice there's this firewall and not in between that makes it necessary to go through a central node in general. I'll get to the details later. Um, now, the firewall aspect isn't a problem at all. I mean, getting through firewalls is just a lot of fun, right? Uh, th that's not a big problem. But not is really nasty because you send out, this is my address, it's rewritten. Or it's not rewritten. You have to figure out how you look on the outside. and It might vary. Briefly said, um, one party, Blue, wants to call Purple, and Blue says, OK, I'm going to use something like Eston to figure out how I look on the outside. What's my IP? What's my port? I'm going to ignore the IP for now. What's the port? It gets a response saying, you look to me like you're active on port A. So then it sends, so it's, then it sends a SIP invite, including a session description saying, please send media to port A. I've got a port reserved for that through Eston. The other party does the same. The purple party says, oh, I'm on port B, apparently, so you can send media to port B. And then the party starts sending media to each other from A to B and from B to A. That's symmetric RTP. That's the only way to keep uh, not and firewalls open, because if traffic travels in one direction only, you are not going to keep it open. Uh, average firewall will close then. Now, the problem is, as soon as you start doing this, you're using a different connection than the one you used to contact the Eston server. ICE is a bit of a solution for that. It says, well, I'm going to use the actual uh, target port for Eston, but it still doesn't completely solve it in all cases. So you end up with another port, and over here, some 
nasty thing happens, like a firewall saying I'm being attacked, or at least the media doesn't arrive. So you end up with, we've probably all experienced it, one-sided one phone calls, I can hear you, you can't hear me. And this is very confusing to users, uh, to us as well, actually, I think. Um, you've got three parties, and everyone can talk, uh, uh, can talk to the top party. So he says, hey, my connection is working. He says, my connection is working. When I call you, it's going wrong. And that's because of the type of knot that can happen. And this part, I should have changed this text, I'm sorry. This party says, you're to blame because I can normally call. And this party says, you're to blame because I can normally call. Now, this is really constructive, but <laughs> uh, this is too confusing. You can't explain this. You can explain you are wrong. You can't explain you are wrong in the case you're talking to somebody else who's also wrong. Now, there are varieties of NAT, and most of you have heard the terms full cone, restricted cone, port restricted, and, and so on. Um, and symmetric, where well, symmetric is the devious one, of course. And as to mesh is what type you, you have. You try it on a few addresses and a few ports, and it comes back with different or the same results, and then you conclude in what category you fall. That has have to be the Russians invading. No time for that now. I've got an hour only. Um, the classification turns out not to be refined enough. And to give you an idea, without bashing anything, Teredo failed on this specific aspect. It assumed that a classification of Aston worked. Based on that, it says, I can indeed give you an IP address. It started communicating and th things go awry because the classification wasn't subtle enough, meaning that one out of three packets doesn't arrive at the destination. Um, one, of the three, one out of three destinations can't be reached, is what I should say. So, symmetric not really is beyond help, but we have to assume it's out there. Some people have it. And we all know how easy it is to replace Soho routers. It's an expense for the people rolling them out. So, in general, to be certain that you can talk to anyone, you will always have to rely on at least a fallback of a remote party that serves as a media proxy. Now, that's not a problem per se. I mean, we're talking about kilobits, right? It's not very interesting. If you take codec 2, you talk about 1,400 bits a second as, a, as, a co as an audio rate. More about that later. But these people will... The, pe the people rolling out this sort of stuff, offering this sort of facility in a shrink wrap package, usually want to charge for a surface and not for a bandwidth. And that somehow feels unfair when you've got the mindset of SIP and telephony should be free and open on the internet. So, um, like we have a telco here in the Netherlands who takes a totally different approach. They're a mobile telco. Two-thirds of them are sitting here, actually. Um, they're a mobile telco who says, we are going, just going to be the tap from the internet to your mobile phone, and we're going to charge you for traffic, and we don't care what you do over it. We're going to help you do it with SIP, and we're going to help you do it openly, and all those things. Um, that model isn't really commonplace. They're really uh, pioneers in that sense. They're brave. Um, so, charging for servers instead of bandwidth is one of the, the free beer aspects that is really missing. So, SIP over IP4 really, to me, means a login danger. I'm not saying everybody's evil. I'm saying it happens and people are captured in such situations. Now, why wouldn't we run SIP over IP6 then? I mean, it solves all the problems. We only have firewalls left, and hey, that's fun to travel through. You just start sending UDP, and the other side does it too, and you've both opened the port, it's symmetric, and you'll get in. There's no address rewriting, so you know what the remote port port is, you know what the remote address is, it's not going to change. You don't need s -turn. Now, one reason to not run SIP over IP6 could be I don't have IP6 yet. That's a bit nost nostalgic, if I may be honest, and you should probably change your provider because they should be ashamed of themselves. Um, we actually have parties rolling out the future internet, and they forget about DNSSEC and about IP6, and yeah, it's over fiber with the same speed as ADSL. Um, my remote party doesn't have IP6 yet. That's a bigger problem. You want to talk to someone, you've done your homework, you're running IP6, but you can't rely that everybody else has. I mean, we all love those models, right? If the entire world would change, it would be a happier place. Yeah, I love them, but it's not going to happen. But should we wait for that? I don't think so. I think we should opt for doing SIP over IP6 right now. And with that rather stubborn approach, 
I've been working for the past few years to define transition tools to create them also so that at least we can have IP6 going and fall back to IP4 for the people who are still mucking around with that old crummy business. Um, oh, well, sh I shouldn't. I think the guidelines say I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't bash on anything, so it's not an IP4. Um, so forcefully running something over IP6 is a bit of a wet dream, so I needed to make the, those, creational t those uh, transitional tools. Um, now, there are tunnels to make this happen, right? And we'll just pick the most, most, most suitable one. Unfortunately, none is. I'll show you in a minute why. Um, but that's basically the approach. Now, the scenario that comes up here immediately is I'm talking IP6, the remote part is talking IP4, I need to transit. Now, what can you do? You could just pick up the SIP and RTP traffic, translate it, and do it bidirectionally. That's not a big problem in itself. Um, of course, you are suffering not, so you want to do it at a public IP, like in a router, for example. And there are, is technology to do this. SER, open SER, open SIPs, Camilio, it's all alter egos of the same product. And probably I'm insulting people who are very clear about licenses at this point, but they're basically the same and they keep up with each other. So you've got a choice which of the same product you run. Green, 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 or green is your choice of colors. Um, these products are reliable, they're efficient, they're well tested. If you use a SIP provider, chances are they run one of these products. They are very generic, meaning they're pretty hardcore to configure, so it's not everybody's cup of tea. And you'll be using the RTP proxy. When I mentioned to one of the mobile guys over there um, that it's so well documented, he immediately burst it out into coughing and he didn't quite agree. And it's indeed very poorly documented. It's actually so poorly documented that I said I can, it's easy to make a new daemon myself and do the translation for myself. And that led to SIP proxy 6.4. And what that does is just what it says. It's a proxy you send on the IP6 side. You send something that comes out as IP4 and the other way. SIP as well as RTP. So you can be on IP4. The remote can be on IP6. The reverse is possible. It covers all current SIP RFCs because the header formats have a limited number of syntaxes. So it's also very easy to add on to that to implement new headers as they are added. Um, and it's virtually stateless. I mean, you've got a session going on, so you need to continue doing RTP, but that makes it operationally very easy to, you just kill the daemon, you start it again. It's UDP, the client will wait, or resend. Um, and it's, it's also, ev every individual packet is treated as one, so it's, it's very hard to make bugs that manifest themselves all over the place. Very important, the size is less than 50 kilobytes. Meaning, at the precise point where you have a public IP4 address, namely your router, you can embed it. Well, that, I think, is quite, quite a useful property. But well, this is a tool, and it works. Well, I made a new version. I have to test it more thoroughly, but yeah, it works. Now, something I learned while doing this, and that's just a sidetrack a bit. Um, I originally, the first version of this, this thing, I used a, a free, freely available SIP parser, the same one, by the way, that Siemens uses in their phones that have forced them to free up their code, which in itself is good. Um, but it has very incomplete documentation. Like, it's very unclear who creates what and who should clean up what memory. So either you've got memory leaks or you've got crashes. Uh, and that, again, I prefer to use my own password instead. And that's a bit of a nuisance. I want to emphasize to all of you guys, do code, but also do document. It's at least as important to do that well, because it's so much effort to figure out what the programmer had in mind. So end of sidetrack. Um, the same goes for RTP proxy that I mentioned. It's also a problem because it is not documented. You just have examples and have to, I mean, we're not Microsoft, right? That's what Microsoft does. And it's proving to be, to make the platform unstable. Um, now, Another reason not to run uh, IP6 for SIP could be you have a piece of hardware and it's not running, uh, it's not, it's, it's not running an IP4 stack, IP6 stack, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, well, we've seen uh, Jeroen's talk yesterday. Jeroen, he's over there. Um, um, hardware is just basically firmware with, in a jacket and you should just open the jacket and play around with it. I'll give a few demos later. Um, a few examples. 
And wouldn't it be nice to have a complete SIP firmware set dedicatedly written to be small, to run on hardware, and to, do, to have a very small layer of hardware drivers, which are just about the same anyway, and rather than piling up the in incredibly large Linux and getting quite a bit extra overhead from that. And of course, have all sorts of dedicated functions on top, not just phones, but also alarm clocks, the front door bell, of course, it's still not running my own code. That's because the Linksys Pi uses a VCD processor that somehow got sidetracked into a phone and is totally not documented and probably programmed in Pascal or something. Um, so that should be another device soon. Uh, a meeting phone, of course, stereo, all that uh, uh, broadband, why not? And of course, it could function as a radio. You've got a device with a speaker on your desktop. I also know an application of a device with a microphone on your desktop. I'm not going to say that aloud because you will fry me. But the government should probably sponsor this. Um, OK, crazy. Uh, I created, am still creating, uh, at least in the concrete demo I'm working on, zero CPM firmware. I yeah, call it firmware because it's a bit firmer than the original firmware. And it indeed is a bottom layer with GPL v3. So yeah, you can port, but you'll have to keep it free, and that's tied to the top layer, which therefore is also GPL, and that runs the SIP applications. And basically, this says, guys, pick it up, use it, replicate it, improve upon it, but then donate back if you start selling it. And that, I think, is important. Runs the best codex. Codex 2 is a project by uh, David Rowe, which, uh, who tries to run a telco on Wi-Fi, uh, sort of reinventing DEC over Wi-Fi because it's free of licenses. He wants to use this in uh, poor countries where a lack of food is being replaced by a lack of telephone capacity or, or money to purchase uh, cell phone capacity. Um, where they used to be ripped off by all sorts of effects in the past, they're now being ripped off by cell phone companies. And he wants to free them from that. And to that end, he's created a codec. He, he's like an audio uh, engineer. He's created a codec which sends 20 times per second. He sends five bytes. And that's not audio data, but describes the, the form of the throat, whether or not something is voiced, uh, that sort of difference, and roughly what the frequency spectrum is of your, uh, of your, of the, of your fowls, your mouth, your nose, all that. And he uses that to reproduce how, you, how your voice sounds. It's amazing work. Go and look it up. I mean, you can hear computers in between. It's, it's not the same voice that you know, but it's recognizable. You can understand what's being said, so it's good enough. Um, radio codex L16, why not use it as a sound card next to your PC? Why have a separate speaker set for that? Uh, Vorbis, uh, yeah, sure, why not? I'm going to have radio, right? A few less likely things, uh, I also implemented real-time text, which is like, as soon as you type a keystroke, it's sent to the other side, and that's specifically interesting to uh, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, because they can, uh, they can sort of interact, they can halfway your typing, they can inj inject something, like you would when I say something wrong. Oh, wait, but what you're going to do now is wrong. They can do that. Um, probably want to do something like a fax relay. And, of course, most important, IP6 anywhere. And I'm getting through that when I get to tunnels. I'm currently doing that with a ground screen uh, BT200. This is how it looks. Well, not on the brochures, but there's this beautiful 12-pin connector and a 6-pin connector. I've forgotten which is which, but there's JTAG there. There's not a serial port, I believe. And there is uh, uh, there's something to bootstrap from, to bootstrap over I square C. When you set one bit to one and the other to zero, then it will download programs fr from I square C. So they need, needed to make a boot floppy. Well, the Linux kernel holds documentation on how you uh, create a, a, a I square C I square C connector for your RS232, sorry, parallel port. And as you can see, it's been made just that when you uh, fold apart the, the pins of, your, of the, the one chip that's in it, you can put on the resistors, you can close the package, and it almost looks like you've delivered neat work. Um, I square C EPROMs usually aren't very big, and I wanted to make a lot of software, of course, because I'm impressive and all that, self absorbed, whoever. Um, so I just stacked eight of them together because there's three pins that can be set to one, ones and zeros to select in what page it falls. So you can, have, you can stack eight of those. Of course, all the connections on one side are the same, just like the, the ground on, over here. The five-fold goes here, uh, three-fold, I'm sorry, goes back here. 
And then the pattern in which this is laid out is not your average binary code, but you would have lots of bridges and all that. I use the gray code, and that means that all the connections look a bit like this, but they never cross. So I managed to do this without adding any uh, extra pins. I could reuse the pins that I had cut off. Totally useless, but, well, fun. Now, of course, you need a digital scope for this stuff. I was very happy with that excuse to be able to, to buy one, by the way. Um, and, and LCD is a big problem. LCDs come in, in, in well, the, the, the chip is either it's part of the glass on which the LCD rests, or it's on a printed circuit board, but then it's not like a proper chip with a number on top. Um, it's, it's actually a sort of rubbery ball, and you can't really scratch it off because the real chip is in there and you'll damage it. So that's still, and it doesn't have a number. So that's very, very useless. Uh, by the way, the, the, the reason I started with this particular device is that the chips on it were covered, the big chips were covered in, in, uh, in, in paint, which tells me it's a common of the shell component that we're trying to conceal. So what you do, you get a glass scraper, and a very big one with a handle is useful. And just like snow shove, you just push off, because the chips are so beautifully flat, you just push off the paint, you see, you see it going off, and you can read the, the, the stuff, and you can download thousands of pages of documentation, which is rather helpful if, well, I'm a bit of an academic, I suppose. I usually work from documentation. Um, now, this is, these are signals observed from the LCD interface, and if I look at this, this looks like a clock signal that is temporarily interrupted. Oh, and at that time, it's... That one's high, so this is probably an LCD, uh, an enable signal for the communication. Then these are bits that are clocked in. There are 2, 4, 6, 12. That's interesting. And that looks like sometimes a 1, sometimes 0. That's probably data. So what I did then, because I didn't have a chip number, but you can look for words like LCD driver. And uh, the 12 bit pattern was a bit special, so I looked for 10 bit, 11 bit, 12 bit. And this data, of course, occurs in a data sheet. All the data you find, you can look up on the internet. And Google will very gladly assist you in finding the right data sheet. So I found a series out of which I could then isolate the precise one that I had. At least it's functioning equivalently, so I don't care. And um, then you can, can start programming it. Something else I saw, which was really confusing, were these lines. It doesn't look, look really digital, right? As it turns out, this is a serial bus on which multiple parties can send and in lockstep. So one sends, the other sends, yet another sends. And to make that possible, every device, when it's not sending, goes to high impedance state. And what you see here is an exponential drop that you generally have when a capacitor is dis discharging, which is what you get when something is floating or high, high impedance. And then I zoomed in on that, and I got something like this, and I was back home again. I understood that it was just... A, a, a quicker burst than I thought it would be. Now, this is one I'm particularly proud of. I finally got the right data sent over this crummy serial connection to the... It's, it's a very nasty, awkward thing, but at least I have documentation, but even then it was hard. But here I'm sending... This is the first time I'm sending the right pattern, I, A5, F0 or something. Um, now, these are, these are digital, right? I mean, they take some time together, but they're digital. This is, again, a bit special, but this is actually an interesting uh, debugging trick or, or measuring trick. What happens here is um, this is a short circuit between two pins. I've, uh, all the time I've been saying, poking, I want to know where this is, and then go using a multimeter to go by the, the pins of the DSP, and at some point it's beep, and you know that you have to figure out which one it is exactly, you start counting and figure out which it is, of course. Now. This is a bit special. I was, my, my, my measuring pin was in between two pins. One is the, the frame sync pin, and the other is the data in pin. And apparently, the data in here is sending signals, and over here is in high impedance, which is why the short circuit doesn't, mat doesn't care. But here, the FS goes to zero, and the data goes to one, to zero, to one, to zero. So that's actually a neat trick to measure if something is high impedance. Yeah, it's nasty, I know. And don't try this at home, of course. Always do this with your employees' gadgets. Never your own. It broke. Um, okay. 
this is about cracking hardware, and I'm working hard to make it possible to, uh, to put your own firmware on there. And the reason I want to do this is not so much, uh, of course, to cater you guys, but it's very much so that I can deliver a stick, a stack, a SIP stack, to all the Chinese manufacturers that want to grow hardware and that are a bit iffy when it comes to software. I'd rather have them run this and where we can maintain it, expand it with new features, new RFCs and so on, so that we can move SIP forward because it's always having the trouble. I can do it, but the telco should play along and the other party should play along. And with something like this, you can hopefully break through that. Now, other scenario, you don't have IPv6. Now, this is a bit of a problem, but it does happen. Um, and, 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 and there are still networks where you can't log in as root, although it takes a bit of exercise sometimes, but um, don't know why, by the way, why they don't let you in. Um, but that basically means you need a tunnel. Now, all you need to do SIP well is it should work behind any NAT problem, but you can have a tunnel server to help you in case you need it. A tunnel server being something generic run by another party than your telco. That's an important distinction with the media proxy. It should be open, it should be simple, uh, preferably. I started off with something simple, ended up with something complex, but whatever. Uh, it should have the ability to track abusers. I'm sorry, um, you shouldn't just grab an address and spam people like hell. Um, no configuration, because I want my parents to plug in a phone and be able to use it without configuring IP6. That might be a wee bit too much for them. Well, they're running IP6, of course, but and DNSSEC and all that. And preferably, the tunnel server I mentioned should be stateless, because that's easier, that's more reliable, and it should be scalable. And that's a challenge, of course, but, well, there are solutions. Now, I looked at a number of tunnels. Please ignore the last column. I reused a, a diagram that says, see, I'm perfect. My, my, uh, my tunnel does everything it needs to do. But all the tunnels have something in disfavor of them, something that is not working well for the particular. Actually, nobody, as far as I know, actually tried to do real-time peer-to-peer communication wherever it's possible. Uh, 6A44 is missing here. It could be added, but uh, 6A44 depends, uh, relies on your ISP to co cooperate. And it also takes configuration, I think. So, it was time for yet another tunnel. Pretty hard to get established, of course, because everyone says, another one, we already have so many. But um, what it does is quite, quite predictably, it runs IP6 wrapped into UDP and IP4. What else? It, that works. It's shown to work in several other protocols. Um, it contacts a SIGBIT4 server, which is like the tunnel server. It gets back its IP6 address, which contains its IP4 address, making it trackable without user registration or need of accounts. And from the beginning, it's actually been rock solid, bugs aside, of course, but it's, it's been a rock solid protocol as long as UDP works. And of course, I'm thinking about the TCP fallback and even on port 443 if you want to be really, but that's like a software choice. It shouldn't be a standard choice, I think. Um, and I mentioned Teredo before. Teredo is based on induction, right? The assumption of Aston, well, you behave like this and probably you've got this category. Turns out that not all swans are white, there are black swans as well. And that's why Teredo fails in so many cases. So what I've done is just being deductive reasoning from facts. What can I assume about UDP? And where can I, what can I certainly be about? And that's why it's so very, very stable. Uh, Michiel is running it everywhere. I'm very proud of that. He's, wherever he opens his laptop, he's got IP6. Uh, he's using a, bit, a Linux tunnel, that I, tunnel client that I wrote. Um, there's a Java implementation, which is a subclass of the datagram socket. And if you can give me a Java-written uh, TCP stack, it could also do TCP, but for now it's UDP only. And there's an Android VPN service uh, paid, paid for by SurfNet uh, in part. So um, you can actually run it on your Android as well. Yeah, there's a link coming later on, a QR code. Be prepared. Now, um, writing a draft isn't an easy, easy track. Um, you always forget something, and there are always people rather keen on pointing these out to you. So the first issue was just client contact server and just everything through the server. Then somebody said, well, you're calling the phone next to you and you're going through the server. That doesn't scale really well. I had to say yes, and I felt embarrassed and shocked and loathing myself and all that. And then I said, oh, wait. And then I said, what you can also do is just, you, you could add P2P very easily but just sending a message to the other side and seeing if you get a response. That's very simple. It's much simpler than classifying not. 
So what I do is I send an ICMP neighbor discovery message, and it sends back a neighbor solicitation. If that happens, we've had an ICMP6 round trip, meaning we've had an IP6 round trip, meaning we've done something within UDP, and we know for sure that not router doesn't know what's traveling over UDP because UDP lacks tagging. That's a feature, guys. That's a feature. That's not a bug. Um, so we can actually assume that if this ICMP go, comes through in both directions, <laughs> that you can actually start peering, as long as you keep your holes open, of course. This is only from the part who sent, because the other part doesn't know if the response came back. So it will have to do the same procedure. And there are very clever tricks of using the SYN and ARC flux and TCP observing those and doing clever things with that to actually make the connection from the beginning, not even do this neighbor solicitation. But that's beyond this talk for now. I if you're interested, tomorrow I'm giving a lecture where I go into the depths of this, this tunnel. Um, just very briefly, um, it's in draft 02. It got posted as 00, 00 because I changed the file name, so it's a bit confusing. I'll try to fix that later on. But just look at the dates and you'll be fine, because these ones are expired. Um, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, it's very well scalable because there are mechanisms to avoid almost ever using the tunnel server. Um, and instead of using Anycast, which was kind of grumpy about at RIPE, um, people don't like using Anycast because we've seen it gone wrong in a number of places. Um, but I needed Anycast to have a, pre a pre prefix that I could recognize as 6 bit 4, so I knew I could directly contact my peer without getting all sorts of harassment warnings uh, on the other side, raising all sorts of flags. So I needed a recognizable prefix, so I've just said I need a slash 32. And then I've got 32 bits left for, well, the server IP address so that we can actually differentiate between them, which is useful. Uh, uh, details, details. Um, the nice thing is can, this can just be posted as an experimental individual thing, so I hope to get this through definitely, finally, in, in a month or two. Um, Nitty-gritty details tomorrow, 2 o'clock, T4. Um, I am... I am every enum registrar for the Netherlands. Um, it's really popular to run enum, and um, um, I've picked it up because I thought it's too important to let drown. And I know enum isn't popular. We're all waiting for all the other guys to do it, which is not the best possible approach, I suppose. But actually, enum has its problems. It, it's, it's the, big, the big thing about enum, it maps phone numbers in a standard way into the DNS, which is our domain and that's not where it came from. So I think it's a very powerful technique to be able to map phone numbers, the other domain, the one we are leaving, hopefully soon, to map the other domain to the real domain, where I'm not 12345, but rick at And um, Eno can really help to smoothen this transition, so whatever you do, guys, please support it in some way. Now, Enum has its own registry of tagging for the natural record, and it includes regular expression. That's a bit nasty. So actually, I'm heading towards the religion that we should just add SFE records for SIP, LDAP, if you want to do phone book reverse lookups, uh, search records for Z at RTP, and that sort of thing. I think it's, this is the way to, 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 to use Enum. It's much easier. And usually, you have a server that needs a user account. Just take the number which is to reverse from what's in DNS without a plus because that confuses stuff. I think this is the way we should go, and I think I'm going to write an ID on that as well because Enum needs some help, I think, and it really needs to. So, guys, if you make something that works towards a domain, please have a quick look at Enum and wonder how easy or how difficult it is to add it if you don't do it the way of the Napster record, but if you can just do what you always did by just Oh, gosh, I've got a number, perhaps, with a plus prefix. Let's turn it around, stick e164.arp at the end, use the, account as, uh, use the phone number as an account number, and you're fit to go again. Just another lookup mechanism, then. Um, to come to conclusions, I have no idea about my time. I missed all the signals, maybe. but um, SIP over IP4 may imply vendor login, and in practice, it often does. I mean, you get this wrap-up solution that... SIP over IP6 can give you total freedom. You can be a record open for, well, I can be a record open for, and you can be Johnny at uh, uh, example.com. Um, 
SIP over IPv6 is possible now, and I think that's the main statement I'm sending here. I've built the tools to make it possible to do it now. Okay, it's all alpha, beta so sort of stuff. It needs to be pulled out. By, uh, I'm looking for a party to help me with that, and then the world will be a better place, I think. Um, there's no need, therefore, to wait for IPv6 to reach the masses, or, as I've told it, right, actually with 6.4, IPv6 is ready. I wrote IP4. That's clumsy. IP6 is ready for the masters. Give me a, a, a felt and I will change it here. Okay. Um, not moving until the majority does. That's something you see a lot. And it's very, very destructive for any progress. And you see it everywhere in the internet where party A and party B need to communicate. It's senseless because there's so many party, party B out there. Let's wait for the majority to move. That means we have no movement. And I've seen several examples of that this week, like uh, browsers still checking upon MD5 MD science certificates, even though they're insecure. It's horror, guys. We need to move forward. We just need to drop the old crap. And SIP over IP4, as far as I'm concerned, is ready to go. So I have a bit more information, including lots and lots of details about reverse engineering that you might lap up quite nicely. Um, just follow this site, visit this site. And Wow, that's a very big lens to be photographing a QR code. Can you hold it up? <laughs> can you hold it up, please? So, the, so every, hold it up so everyone can see it. That's what it's using to shoot a QR code. <laughs> that's pretty high tech. Okay, uh, that's what I wanted to say. Are there any questions? Um, there are. Good. Oh, he's smiling. That's also good. If you have. Phone in the middle. Is this working? Okay. So the question is about this uh, tunnel six, Bravo Echo Delta four or how it's called. Six four. Okay. Um, so if I understand correctly, it's stateless, and on the IPv4 side, it uses UDP. Uh, it's stateless on the server side, which is very important for maintenance there for being able to reroute stuff. The the point is. If you insert one UDP packet on one side yep. and you get an IPv6 packet on the other side without any check except for the source IP oh, address. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, it does that. It does that. Yeah. <laughs> you know um, where I'm getting. Yeah, the IP6 address of the sender contains its IP4 address and its UDP port in the lower part of the address. And it ships that either to the server, which checks it, or to the remote, who, of course, checks it as well. There should be a consistency between the IP4 address and the UDP port. Okay. Um, the, the way I get this address is through a router solicitation to the server, and I get back a router advertisement. If I send something that's wrong, either to a peer or to the router, it will actually respond with a retraction of the old prefix, that is uh, slash 114. It will retract the old prefix and give you a new prefix containing the new IP4 address and UDP port, and otherwise, otherwise just booger off because you're doing something wrong. The, the point is there is no secret inserted in the packet which will uh, uh, certify that this is the right packet. It is uh, just a matter of, uh, for, for the attacker to guess the IP address in, uh, addresses involved and the spoof its own IP address, which we know it's yeah. not a problem. Yeah. And if, this is, uh, if uh, the attacker is right, he will uh, just insert this packet and this yeah. will be happily okay. forwarded. Okay. I'm <laughs> if your point is that transport, uh, at a transport level, everything should be secure, there is a standard for that. Um, you can run any VPN, and, and, and usually it's, uh, what is it called? It's a horrible standard. It's like a committee standard. Oh, come on, the standard VPN stuff. Uh, IPsec, of course. Uh, well, of Sorry. course. Sorry. <laughs> um, if you think you shouldn't do it at this level, but instead use TLS encryption over your uh, connection, so do things at the application level. Use a TLS connection for SIP, and use ZRTP or something of that nature to encrypt your further traffic, and you use DNSSEC for your lookups. This stuff is better resolved at the application level, I think. OK, I see. Uh, what I was getting at was uh, uh, these uh, attacks from, I think, uh, the name was Dan Kaminsky, uh, from, uh, uh, for example, where he can map your internal network based on the fact that if uh, he's uh, guessing the right IPs and port combinations uh, on your uh, NAT device, 
he will be able to send packets to uh, uh, basically your DNS server and the DNS yep. server will go out and query uh, his DNS server yep. and he will be able to map yep. the network behind the net. Yep. So this is exactly the same attack yep. basically yep. with different tools. <laughs> Again, there are solutions for this that don't have to be solved when you make an IP tunnel. Okay, um, Dan Kuminski, it's too late to shoot him and that wouldn't be good either because he does very useful work. Um, so I suppose the best option then is to use DNSSEC. And I'm, yeah, I, I've heard about DNSSEC a bit and it's a good idea. Sorry? Okay. Thank Secure you. neighbor discovery. Okay, uh, rough with, with patents, so that's a bit scary, but for the, oh, that, that I should have mentioned, sir. Um, the neighbor discovery protocols for route solicitation at first multiplication for IP and the ICP ping back and forth are indeed uh, using a nonce and a, and a timestamp. Yep. No signatures, those, because those are patent written, some idiot thought. Yeah. I have a question about uh, Enum. Um, if you get a wet watermelon there, then you get a, a free domain name. Um, where do I get my free phone number? without a landline attached or anything else attached and complicated ways of paying and whatnot. Well, do, you have, do you have a domain name? Yes. Pick any username at no, the no, domain No, no, no. The name. thing is people promote Enum. Yeah. And it's, it's so bad that, for example, the, 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 the most well-known SIP client on Android, you can only dial numbers, yeah. even though my phone is perfectly... That's exactly where Enum comes in. Yeah. No, no, no. So the thing is, even though my phone is capable of dialing a domain name, this application is so rooted in the idea that a phone number is only digits that yep. you can dial anything. And there's still people promoting the idea that a phone number is only digits. Uh, so yep. I would like people to promote that if you use SIP, that you can use any arbitrary domain name because then we can I'm move forward. I'm very much pr promoting that, yes. Uh, um, I'm involved in a project together, Michiel, here, where we try to put a lot more under domain names than is currently the case. Um, struggling for, for money to get it funded because we want to hire a lot of open source developers to do this um, so that we have a direction and get things started. But this is definitely part of it. By the way, go to callfilter.net and you can set up an SOV record there and you can uh, actually do this. I haven't put instructions online to that, but you're welcome to send me an email if you, if you care and I'll happily serve you at a best, uh, best effort basis, no problem. And if one thing else is more a remark, is people don't want another IPv6 tunneling protocol. So yeah. certainly not where the Pro ISP is not do. involved. Programmers do, users don't. And that's exactly why it should be configured. No, the, the thing is, I mean, the, 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 the most of the, I mean, a tunneling protocol is fine if the ISP does it. I mean, 6RD proves that it's fine. But it, the, it, uh, the thing is that um, most people who run other tunneling protocols, they don't involve the ISP. So if, if you want to promote that on a very large scale, then essentially you get all kinds of network problems that are hard to debug and nobody wants that. So, I mean, I, I think that from a technical point of view, you, your uh, protocol is fine. Yeah. But if you look at from an operational point of view, it's, it's just a no-go. It's no a, <laughs> a bit complicating. Um, I do want to have a standard UDP port, so Wireshark at least can uh, figure out that it's IP6 and they won't even show the IP4 and UDP headers. And that's quite frankly the solution to that, I think. Most of it, it's a bit more difficult if you start tapping traffic, uh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Another one. Hi, Rick, you know me? Um, yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> um, we've, uh, at Speak Up where I work, we have an IPv6 SIP trunk, uh, which uh, works quite nicely, uh, even between IPv4 and IPv6 endpoints. We have one big problem that uh, um, there are, uh, from what I've seen, very little hardware SIP phones that actually support a proper IPv6 stack, mm -hmm. let alone a dual stack phone. It's, it's simply not out there yet. Um, Grandstream well, is selling them now. I know that Linksys is or was working on them. I don't know how far they are. Uh, Cisco slash Linksys. Yeah. Um, and I've got my firmware on the way. That's a, I'm really looking forward to that, but until that time, I mean, um, I, I think I know quite a lot about SIP, but I'm not going to screw open a, a grand stream or a soft phone and yeah. solder on it to get the IPv6 yeah. stack working. Yeah. So is there anything in between that you can say, if you want to get working with IPv6 and SIP, 
what can I do without soldering something? One of the reasons I made SIP Proxy 6.4 is to announce IPsec addresses for my front door bell to the, to the world, which is a, a Cisco Linksys phone. Um, I really want it to look like IP6, even though it isn't internally. So you can always make that transition as well, make that translation. It's bidirectional. Uh, yeah, and otherwise, just take a screwdriver, a soldering gun, a multimeter, <laughs> or talk to the manufacturers. And perhaps you are at the scale where you can know you can't because you don't. Well, we have quite some contacts with the manufacturers, uh, yeah. especially SNOM, uh, which has a pretty good uh, SIP stack. But uh, SNOM released an IPv6 uh, firmware, but later they said themselves, well, sorry, it's not really working. And we're trying to promote it, but they're not simply not going for it. So, but I um, mean, we can push some more. <laughs> yeah, or you could introduce me or whatever. I'd be happy to talk to them. Harder is fun. Yeah. Okay. You might have noticed that for my slides. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, half an answer. Sorry. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. good enough. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm a colleague of uh, Simon and. Um, uh, another problem uh, we encountered was uh, the legacy uh, telephones on IPv4 uh, that didn't really understand what was in the SIP packet anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, um, yeah. a, a nice example was a, a Linksys phone that started uh, parsing the route table, of, uh, the, the, the route uh, headers. Yeah. Uh, so it saw an IPv6 address and thought, hey, a there's a port number. Yeah. Yeah, I um, so that, that, that's a big, um, uh, uh, yeah. a, a big problem because yeah. you can't call anyone using that phone. Yeah, um, there is an RFC describing an SDP format where you can use an IP4 address and an IP6 address, and I would not advise using that precisely for this reason. Um, for the rest of the world who doesn't program SIP phones, um, SIP passes are usually bit like this, like uh, exactly what he says, I've also noticed, let's scan for a column because that's probably the start of a port number. Uh, they're, they're not quite complete passes, validating passer or, or, or anything, so that is a problem. So I would never ever send IP6 written packets to an IP4 phone. And that's exactly why I made this translation, it's either IP4 or IP6. And if you want to do both, uh, if, if a phone has two, two addresses, I would let it register twice. And then this was just the root um, uh, header, so it shouldn't even try to touch it. Okay, I'm not guilty. I agree, but okay. <laughs> it's 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 uh, these phones are horrible. But, but your proxy doesn't uh, send any IPv6 addresses anywhere in the SIP packet. Uh, Sorry, say that again. Uh, your proxy uh, uh, doesn't send any IPv6 addresses in the whole SIP packet to an IPv6 phone. Either or. Okay. Always either that or. That, that that that's my, in my experience, the solution, and sounds like you've had the same experience. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Any, Any other question? If not, then uh, Rick is available Thanks. after this talk in the media yeah. cafe uh, for any uh, free consultancy. Make use <laughs> of it. Uh, thank you very much, Rick. Thank you.